Let's bow our heads a moment. Lord, bless as we turn to a lesson from you and your word. May it touch our hearts and mold our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. John 1, beginning in verse 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. In the begin- he was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. Stop for a minute there. Uh, Some of you I may have shared with that early in my Christian journey, I I grew up in a Seventh-day Adventist home, but I didn't start out as a theology major. I started out as maths and sciences. It was the obvious thing. That's what I was good at. And I got to my senior year of college before I went as a student missionary and changed and came back and took theology. It was while I was a student missionary in Korea that I got my theological start with books, some of which were early Adventist books that still had the concept that Jesus had a moment of beginning somewhere in the distant past. That's what I read. Sounded right to me. There was stuff in scripture sounded that way. It took me a while to sort that one out. John 1 verse 3 is what nailed it down for me. Because it says, all things were made through him. And then it flips it around and says it again, kind of the other way around. Without him, nothing was made that was made. If you draw a line between the things that were not made and the things that were made, which side of the line is Jesus on? All the things that were made are on the other side of the line, and he made them. Nothing that was made was made without him making it. He is not one of those things. He's on the other side of the line. He's the one that made, not was made. And then, of course, Ellen White makes it very clear. In him was life original, unborrowed, and underived. Now, some of the early Adventists had trouble when they read that. And one of them made a specific appointment to go visit with her because he didn't believe she actually wrote that. He thought the editors put it in. And he asked to see her handwritten manuscript for the book Desire of Ages, and she let him read it, and there it was. And he said later at a meeting, you can't imagine how that struck us. We thought she was teaching heresy at the time, (laughs) because there were so many who thought that there was a point of beginning for Jesus, but he is eternal God always, and he is not one of the things made. He's the maker of all that was made. Verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. As we remember what Jesus has done for us on an Easter weekend, we owe it all to him. There's, there's nothing that happens for our salvation that he didn't do. Hebrews 4. I'm going to start verse 3, and and it's not really the central point today. I'm not going to spend a long time on this, but it says, For we who have believed do enter that rest, as he has said. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. He's talking about the rest of Canaan for the nation of Israel, which many of them didn't actually have the rest that God wanted. Although, he says, the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way. God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And in this place, they shall not enter my rest. Therefore, it remains that some must enter it. And those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience. And it goes on to say there remains a rest for the people of God. A resting. And he says at the creation, the works were finished. 
Well, God made the world, and he gave it to us as a gift. Now, Carol and I like to garden and plant trees. and uh, We didn't make those things. We plant seeds, we cut cuttings, we put them in the dirt, we do all kinds of things with them, but we didn't make any of those things. God made all those things, gave it to us as a gift, and we use the gift he has given us, but he did all the work back at creation. It was done in the first six days, right? It was done. Salvation's like that. He did it, and he gives it to us as a gift to use. We don't do it. We can't do it any more than I can create a palm tree or a fig tree or whatever it is. I can't make it. I can work with what he's given. It's his finished work, his gift. Now, right up until the last couple of weeks, I used to think that when it said the works were finished from the foundation of the world, it meant just the works of creation were finished from the foundation of the world. And that in a similar manner, God has finished the work of salvation and given that to us. But I think when he says the works were finished, he means both kinds of works were finished from the foundation of the world because creation and salvation were intertwined in God's mind and he already knew that the sin problem was coming and he already has the solution prepared. And when he spoke the first word, let there be light, he already is doing salvation too. Salvation was a done deal at that moment. God was irrevocably committed and has already promised it will be so. When he began the creation and finished the work of creating, he also finished the work of salvation because it says, you know, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. He's already committed to that when they created our world. Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3 and verse 24. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. The nutshell summary of the heart of salvation. Justified freely by his grace through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. Uh, Wayne Kuzer posts every morning. Some of you get that. Uh, and uh, a few days back, April 6th, one of his posts caught my eye and triggered a train of thought I want to share with you guys today. Colossians 1, verse 26. Colossians 1. Verse 26. The mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but has now been revealed to his saints. Paul says, I am a minister of this stewardship that God has given me, the mystery hidden from the ages, now revealed. What is that mystery that has been hidden for, from the ages past, but now is revealed? Well, 1 Timothy 3.16 lists a number of elements of that mystery. 1 Timothy 3.16 And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the, in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the word, world, received up in glory. Those are some of the elements of that mystery, but I'm pretty sure there's at least one more. I think there's probably more than that. I want to explore one other one with you today. Um, grace, grace. 
is grace important to our salvation? We're saved by grace, not by works. Uh, By grace you're saved through faith. It is very central to our salvation. Uh, You you can't get it out of the middle of the thing. It's it's right there in the middle. There's other pieces that work with it, but grace is right there at the heart of our salvation. Acts chapter 20 Acts 20, verse 24. Acts 20, verse 24. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. The gospel. Gospel is good news. It's the good news about our salvation. But here he says it's the good news of the grace of God. That's the gospel. You can summarize the gospel as God's grace to us, is what Paul is saying there. And then verse 32 of the same chapter, just down a few verses. So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, the word about his grace, the teaching, preaching, sharing about his grace. Titus, chapter 2, Verse 11, Titus Philemon Hebrews, <laughs> Titus chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. The grace of God brings salvation. And then Hebrews 4, verse 16. Hebrews 4, 16. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. It's a word that gets used a lot in the New Testament about our salvation. Grace. What is grace? I want to read the quote that came out of Wayne's post. We would never have learned the meaning of this word grace had we not fallen. Why so? God loves the sinless angels who do his service and are obedient to all his commands, but he does not give them grace. They have never needed it, for they have never sinned. Grace is an attribute of God shown to undeserving human beings. We do not seek after it, sorry, we did not seek after it, but it was sent in search of us. God rejoices to bestow this grace on everyone who hungers for it, not because we are worthy, but because we are so utterly unworthy. Our need is the qualification which gives us the assurance that we will receive this gift. God has never given grace to the angels. Why? They don't need it. They haven't sinned. Who needs grace? We need grace because we have sinned. All sinners, that's all of us, need grace. We can't solve our sin problem ourselves. Can't do that. We need his grace to solve that problem for us. But it caught my mind. We would never have learned the meaning of the word grace had we not fallen. Isn't that part of the mystery then? 
something about God that would never have been known like it's known now if sin had not come up. Because he never would have exercised loving kindness toward someone who was out of harmony with him because everybody was in harmony with him before sin came along. There was no need to fix the problem and so there was no need of grace. The universe itself would never have known or seen what grace is had we not fallen. To me, I think that was a new thought. I don't remember ever thinking that one before. Maybe I did and it got away from me. I don't know for sure. Maybe on a test I could have given you the right answer, but it never hit my heart like it caught me this time. Exodus 34, 6. God describes himself to Moses when Moses says, show me your glory. Exodus 34, verse 6. Watch for the words that run parallel to the word grace in here. Exodus 34, 6. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. What are some of the words in there that run parallel to the word grace? Merciful, long-suffering, goodness, forgiving. All of those concepts are relatives of the word grace, expressing the same or a very similar concept. They are related. They are related. Uh, And then Psalm 86, which, by the way, is very close to a quote from the verse we just read. Psalm 86, verse 15 couple of changes. And again, watch the the parallel wording here. But you, O Lord, are a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering, abundant in mercy and truth. Compassion, grace, long-suffering, mercy, it's all parallel concepts. This is a part of who God is. This is who God is, right? In fact, as sinners, we know God primarily as the God of grace. And it came as a start to me, quite a shock, to realize there was a time when the universe didn't know him that way. The rest of the universe did not know God as a God of grace. They knew him as a God of love. Now, his grace comes out of his love, and they always knew he was a God of love. And they're not unrelated, and it's not like they didn't know that God's a good God. Well, absolutely they knew God was a good God. But the grace thing they'd never seen because it had never been seen. And it was one of those things that was hidden. Couldn't be seen because there'd never been a chance for it to show itself. Romans 5. Romans 5, we're going to start with verse 15. But the free gift is not like the offense. For by the one man's offense, many died. Much more, the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. Uh, This passage goes on comparing Adam's sin and Jesus' recovery of that. And when it says, not like the offense, so is the free gift. I think that's close to what the King James says. And to me, that's like saying there are two gloves, right hand and left hand. They are not the same, but man, are they related. (laughs) They are related 
all the way down, the thumbs, the fingers, they all have a contrast with the other part of the other one, but they're opposites. They're opposites. The unlike like, the opposite likeness, and I think that's what he was trying to say there, the, the negative image of each other. Uh, verse 17. For if by one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. Adam's offense is contrasted to the abundant grace God gives through Jesus. That's the solution to the problem that came in when Adam sinned. And then verse 20 and 21. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. Sin can't win against grace. The Bible also can, compares good and evil to light and darkness. How much power does darkness have against light? You think about it, whenever you turn on a light, darkness can't hold it back. Now, things can shadow it, but darkness itself cannot stop or hinder light. Darkness doesn't. Objects that cast a shadow might, but darkness itself, as soon as you turn on the light, it automatically wins against darkness wherever it is. And so it is with God's grace against sin. Wherever it is free to go, and we're not hiding behind something else, it's going to push away. Verse 21. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Sin reigned to death. Grace reigns through righteousness to eternal life. You see the parallels that are contrasting opposites. Nice passage. Uh, it, it, those kind of plays are, are all through those, those verses. But grace abounded more. Where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. That's who God is. That's who God has always been. But we didn't always know that in that context till sin came along and we got to see God's response to sin. And it's a beautiful thing. Ephesians chapter 3. We're going to read a little bit more around where our scripture reading was this morning. Ephesians chapter 3. I'm going to start in verse 1. For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery as I have briefly written already. So there's the grace of God given to Paul and the mystery that has been revealed in our times. Verse 4, by which when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. So even in the history of this world, a knowledge of God and his grace is a growing thing, which was not always as clear in the past as it was in Paul's day, and probably not as clear in Paul's day as it can be in our day, because we got everything he had, and since then, we see God working as well. Verse 6, that Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. There may be some here who have Jewish ancestry, but I don't think I do, as far as I know. A lot of us don't. And man, am I glad the gospel went to the Gentiles. <laughs> I would not like to be on the outside. I like it much better on the inside of God's grace, for he wants us all. Verse 7, of which I became a minister according to the gift of grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. Verse 8. To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see that see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ. To the intent, this is the purpose now, to the intent that now, 
the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. Pause on that verse and ponder that for a minute. Who's teaching what to who? Well, God is the ultimate teacher, but who is he using to teach with or through? The church. The church, that's us. And who is he teaching? The principalities and powers in heavenly places. Excuse me. Don't the angels teach us? Usually? I mean, really? Doesn't God send angels to teach? Yes, he does. He uses angels to teach people. But here's one where we're teaching. The principalities and powers in heavenly places. God's wisdom and his grace. The mystery hidden from ages past. According to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus, our Lord. His purpose is to teach his grace to the rest of the universe. And we are exhibit A. It's not that we're so great at this, but we're exhibit A. Watch it work, right? Watch it work. See what I can do in their lives. Back up one chapter, Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 4. The first part's a little bit uh, background. I flipped my page the wrong way. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy... Because of his great love with which he loved us. So watch the words parallel to grace. What do you see there? Mercy and great love. Even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. There's grace. There it is. And raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship. Margin reading. We are his masterpiece. When God as a craftsman makes something, does he make it well? He looked over everything he'd made in creation and he said it was very good. It worked. It was beautiful. It was perfect. It was good. When God makes something, it's good. When people make something, it always has a certain coarseness to it. When we put man's work under a microscope, a really strong microscope, The sharp edge of a razor blade looks like a mountain range. When we put God's work under a microscope, the little whip flagellum on the bacterium has like 10 or 12 cells around a rotor in there that spins. And it's perfect. At the smallest molecular level, down to the atomic level, it's perfect. It doesn't get rough and coarse when you magnify it. It gets more and more finely crafted as you look at it. That's one of the huge differences between God made it and it just happened. Look in a microscope. You can usually tell the difference there. God's stuff is finely done. The other stuff is... Coarsely done. Good enough. And and we have to say that when we're making stuff. I used to work as a machinist, about a thousandth of an inch. For almost everything we did was good enough. Good enough. And it was. It was perfectly fine. (laughs) Perfectly fine. God laughs at that level of of perfection. But now, uh, let's go back for a minute. 
When it says we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for what? For good works. God created us to be a channel of his good works to the world and to the universe. Now, it just said we're not saved by works. That's true. But that's the fruit of coming into a relationship with Jesus. He works on us, and we become his masterpiece of craftsmanship in the spirit and the soul. And he makes us like him. And then we live like him. And we do the kind of things he does. And, and, and the works flow out of us the same as they came out of Jesus. And it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, back to verse 7. There's a so that. At the beginning of that verse. It doesn't say so, but it says that. So uh, here it says, he has verse 6. He has raised us up together, made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. When is this lesson book to the universe about God's grace going to quit working or no longer be needed? No, in the ages to come, it's going to keep on going. For all eternity and for all the universe, God's grace is shown in the lives of sinners. But it was hidden in the beginning because angels don't need grace. They've never sinned. We would never have learned the meaning of this word grace had we not fallen. It was hidden. But now, God shows it to the principalities in heaven, to the eternal ages, to the universe, the goodness of his grace. Thank you, Wayne. Got me. <laughs> he shared an Ellen White quote. God is love, and everything about him is good. Always has been, always will be. And in eternity past, the creatures of heaven knew this. They knew that. We are saved by his grace. One of the main ways his love and goodness are manifested is his grace to us unworthy sinners. In our life, that's really central. <laughs> really central. His grace was never exercised and remained hidden to the universe before we sinned. So, his grace is part of that mystery of godliness hidden in ages past, but now revealed in the church. We are trophies of his grace. We will be displayed in the ages to come in order that his grace may be understood and appreciated by the powers in heavenly places and the rest of the universe. I think that's very cool. Very cool. So, let's open our hearts to that grace. Let it work. Let us do it. Let it do its thing in us. So that we can become his masterpieces. His grace doing his works in us. Good works. Let him show his love. His goodness. His grace. Through us to the whole universe. And besides. That's how we are saved from sin. Not a bad fringe benefit. Not a bad fringe benefit. Lord, thank you for your loving character. And the universe has always known that you are loving. But thank you that you have shown us that you are a God of grace. Fill us with that grace. Change us by that grace. 
Use us to display that grace. In Jesus' name.